Hello, my name is Hazan Sorrells, and this is the Leadership Lessons from the Great Books podcast, episode number 32, with my special guest today, Professor Momin Kazi. Hello, hey Momin. How are you doing? Super. Awesome. Glad to be here. So we are today going to cover a very difficult text. It's short, but that doesn't mean it's easy. The Signet Classic Version. Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness with an introduction by Joyce Carol Oates. And we're going to talk about Heart of Darkness today. We're going to talk about Apocalypse Now. And we're going to talk about what leaders can take from this very difficult text. And reading directly from Heart of Darkness, and I quote, the Nelly, a cruising yawl, swung to her anchor without a flutter of sails and was at rest. The flood had made the wind was nearly calm and being bound down the river the only thing for it was to come to and wait for the turn of the tide the sea reach of the thames stretched before us like the beginning of an interminable waterway <clears throat> in the offing the sea and the sky were welded together without a joint and in the luminous space the tanned sails of the barges drifting up with the tide seemed to stand still in red clusters of canvas sharply peaked with gleams of varnished spirits a haze rested on the low shores that ran out to sea in vanishing flatness. The air was dark above Gravesend, and farther back still seemed condensed into a mournful gloom, brooding motionless over the biggest and the greatest town on earth. The director of companies was our captain and our host. We four affectionately watched his back as he stood on the bows looking to seaward. On the whole river, there was nothing that looked half so nautical. He resembled a pilot, which to a seaman is trustworthiness personified. It was difficult to realize his work was not out there in the luminous estuary, but behind him within the brooding gloom. Between us there was, as I have already said somewhere, the bond of the sea. Besides holding our hearts together through long periods of separation, it had the effect of making us tolerant of each other's yarns and even convictions. The lawyer, the best of old fellows, had, because of his many years and many virtues, the only cushion on deck and was lying on the only rug. The accountant had brought out already a box of dominoes and was toying architecturally with the bones. Marlowe sat cross-legged right aft, leaning against the mizzen mast. He had sunken cheeks, a yellow complexion, a straight back, an ascetic aspect, and with his arms dropped, the palms of his hands outward resembled an idol. We exchanged a few words lazily afterwards. There was silence on board the yacht. For some reason or other, we did not begin that game of dominoes. We felt meditative and fit for nothing but placid staring. The day was ending in a serenity of still and exquisite brilliance. The water shone pacifically. The sky, without a speck, was a benign immensity of, unsustained, of unstained light. The very mist on the Essex marsh was like a gauzy and radiant fabric hung from the wooden rises inland and dropping the low shores in diaphanous folds. Only the gloom to the west, brooding over the upper reaches, became more somber every minute, as if angered by the approach of the sun. And at last, in its curved and imperceptible fall, the sun sank low, and from glowing white changed to a dull red, without rays and without heat as if about to go out suddenly, stricken to death by the touch of that gloom brooding over a crowd of men. Forthwith, a change came over the waters, and the serenity became less brilliant, but more profound. The old river, in its broad reach, rested unruffled at the decline of day, after ages of good service done to the race that peopled its banks, spread out in the tranquil dignity of a waterway leading to the uttermost ends of the earth. We're going to skip ahead a little bit. The sun set, the dusk fell on the stream, and the lights began to appear along the shore. The Chapman Lighthouse, a three-legged thing, erect on a mud flat, shone strongly. Lights of ships moved in the fairway, a great stir of lights going up and going down, and farther west on the upper reaches, the place of the monstrous town was still marked ominously on the sky, a brooding gloom and sunshine, a lurid glare under the stars. And this also, said Marlowe suddenly, has been one of the dark places of the earth. And I quote, 
from the Nigerian writer and post-colonial cultural critic, uh, Chinua Ashibi. And I'm probably mispronouncing that. Dr. Kazi will correct me in just a moment here. His essay, Image of Africa, from 1975, quote, Heart of Darkness projects the image of Africa as the quote-unquote other world, the antithesis of Europe and therefore of civilization, a place where man's wanted intelligence and refinement are finally mocked by triumphant bestiality. The book opens on the River Thames, tranquil, resting peacefully, quote-unquote, at the decline of day after the ages of good service done to the race that peopled its banks. But the actual story will take place on the River Congo, the very antithesis of the Thames. The River Congo is quite decidedly not a river emeritus. It has rendered no service and enjoys no old age pension. We are told that, quote unquote, going up that river was like traveling back to the earliest beginnings of the world. And yet, this is my thought, the book persists. Listed consistently as one of the half dozen greatest short novels in the English language, and it continues to defy interpretation, analysis, and even postmodern deconstructing. Because in the end, Joseph Conrad was Polish and a Polish writer with a complicated past who persisted almost apologetically in his Victorianism, in the dawning light of Darwinism, Freudianism, and the <laughs> slouching towards Bethlehem nihilism of the 20th century. And to offer a deeper perspective on this short story, I can think of no better person to join us today than Tarleton State University's own professor of English, Dr. Momin Kazi. Once again, welcome, Momin. Thank you very much. I'm so happy to be here and uh, talk about this very, like you've called it, very complicated um, but persisting novel, yeah. Tell us a little bit about what you do at Tarleton State University and uh, just for our listeners who don't know you, uh, where is Tarleton, what do you do there and why do you care about Heart of Darkness? Oh, wow. Um, well, I'm a professor at Tarleton State University which is located in Stephenville, Texas. Um, just right here in Central Texas, not far from Granbury and the Dallas-Fort Worth region. Um, it's a regional university. It's the second largest A&M university in the A&M system. Um, and uh, I've been here since 2006. And the, uh, the reason that I care so much about Heart of Darkness is my main area of expertise when I was working on my doctoral studies is in 19th and 20th century British literature. Um, so one of my kind of like sub expertises is theory and one of those theories is post-colonial studies. And so as I was feeling a, a real affinity towards the, um, the study of nations and peoples and cultures that have been colonialized, but now it's the aftermath in a post-colonial world, uh, I, I found that Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness is a really uh, wonderful um, example of the, the colonial mindset, uh, even if Joseph Conrad himself was critical of empire. It's still very much a text that reinforces and in some ways uh, showcases or illustrates the imperial mindset that that is in some ways appears very altruistic but is is a, is really under its surface very rapacious and so uh, as the son of an immigrant from India who uh, was born in India then he was uh, uprooted and after partition and moved to Pakistan and then he immigrated to the United States in the early 60s and then my, my mother who is from the United States and then had they had me and uh, I grew up in the United States born in, in California then moved to Texas and so as someone who has that kind of heritage and background uh, I, I have a real draw towards stories that that deal with that um, imperial 
you know, uh, legacy. And, and then I'm very interested in its aftermath. And that's why I'm also interested in Chinua Chebe's uh, response to Heart of Darkness, because uh, he looks at it and says, my students, he was a teacher in Nigeria, my students, uh, their only knowledge of Africa is from a book by a man from Poland who writes in English named Joseph Conrad. <laughs> And he goes, if that's the story that they think is Africa or African, then I need to remedy that. And, and, and so that's why his book, Things Fall Apart, is so important. So, so for me, when you ask about Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, I was just so happy to be able to talk about it because I think those two texts really are a defining moment in the last 150, 200 years. We've talked about a lot of different topics on this podcast because you can't really talk necessarily always about literature and leadership sure. and the intersections between literature and leadership without talking about a whole bunch of other things. And while we are not a political podcast, I say that over and over and over again, um, we don't get into Republican versus Democrat. We don't get into progressive versus conservative um, to me, those are banal distinctions that don't have any relation really to real life, the real life that most people live, right? Um, they might be interesting for MSNBC or for Fox News, but for the rest of us that have to actually grind it out out here, <laughs> yeah, uh, there's real decisions with real consequences that have to be really made. And there's real leadership that needs to be had that has to go beyond the extremes to the really sometimes complicated middle, right? There's several things you mentioned, and so I, I, I frame all of that to, to also say this. We also cover history, and we talk about literature. You can't talk about literature without putting it in its own particular historical context, or even philosophy. We talk about philosophy on this podcast, right? Um, yeah. We talk about the greatest, the greatest books of Western literature, even the ones that make us uncomfortable. And, and we talk about free speech here on this, too, because, quite frankly— Speech that is free should make you uncomfortable. You don't have a right to be comfortable. I don't fundamentally believe that, um, nor do I believe that words are violence. I, I believe we have to have ideas, and we have to have a free exchange of those ideas, even if they make you feel bad. Okay. Heart of Darkness makes people feel bad <laughs> for a whole variety of reasons. Um, and even when I was reading it, I, I was commenting to my wife, I see why people in a modern context have trouble, have trouble teaching this book to a 19 year old like you do <laughs> that may be basted in our current culture that says um, mirror variations of basically one message, which is you can create a reality on Instagram or on on TikTok. Nothing invades that reality because you control it on your mobile phone. And anything that does invade it that even moderately makes you feel uncomfortable, you don't have to deal with. You can just get rid of the root thing. And that's happening to degrees in various university institutions all across our country. As a professor, this is one of the core questions I wanted to ask you, because there are hard words in this book. Like we're going to we're going to pull quotes from the book. Uh, I'm going to drop the N word because that's the word that's in the book. We cannot get away from literature as it is written, otherwise we wind up in censorship, and that's not good either. So we have to deal with Conrad, and we have to deal with language, and we have to deal with our feelings about that language. Yeah. How do you teach this book <laughs> to 19-year-old Gen Zers? Well, one, I try to have them read it which is, you know, just uh, its own challenge. It's a yeah. very uh, challenging read. It's a very complicated read because the, the writing is very, um, it's, it's, it's magnificent mm -hmm. in its grammatical structure, in its, um, in its uh, you know, sentence patterns. I mean, it, it's just a phenomenal, even just listening to you read it again, just, for me, punctuated just how beautiful his writing is. It's, mm -hmm. it's impeccable. The thing about it is it's as languid as a 
river that uh, on the surface looks like it's not doing anything, but underneath that surface, it is churning, it is moving. The current is hard and, and, uh, and intense. And the thing about this text is um, it requires you to dive in, you know, to use the metaphor of, of the river still, um, and go with the flow. And if you fight it, you're going to have a really rough time with the text. Um, but if you go with that flow, that stream of consciousness that, that, he, that he does, um, it, it's, it's worth it. So I just, when I encourage my students, I just say basically, you know, jump in and let go mm-hmm. and just let it take you. Don't try to figure out and understand and, and analyze everything as it comes. You know, like, go with it. Go with and it. then, of course, it's a short novel, but it's a long novella. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, it, it, and so I, I say to them, you know, like, okay, if you think you can get through it in three readings, do that. But then, you really ask, it, it's really begging you to read it again. Mm-hmm. It's not a one read text. It's and um, now when it comes to the language, it's not just the words that are controversial, uh, like you said, the N word. It's the, it's the it's mindset the that yeah. that it reveals that yeah. that is uncomfortable. And so I just try to encourage my students not to get hung up on the the idea that Achebe said that um, Joseph Conrad was a thoroughgoing racist. He, he wasn't saying that because Conrad uses the N word. Mm-hmm. It's because he's just saying as a product of his time, he couldn't, like you've mentioned, an intrepid Victorian. Well, I mean, he said, you know, he's in what was the exact word you use? It was, um, I think, using the, um, he was almost apologetically in his Apologetic. Victorianism yes. in the dawning of, right? So he he is a Victorian. And so he is, he is going to be uh, reflecting the, the, whether he means to or not, you know, no matter how critical he is of empire or not, he still is reflecting uh, a, a racism at its core that Achebe has a problem with. And, and his, his argument is very convincing in that he says, it's not that, that Conrad has this character Marlowe uh, reveal um, the humanity of, of, of Africans. Mm-hmm. He just says that in so doing, he acts almost aghast and surprised. <laughs> it's like when someone says, oh my goodness, you're, you're so articulate for a black man. You know, he, he goes, why are you surprised? You know, right. You, right. you shouldn't assume that, that the, the lack of articulation is going to come with, with color or race or whatever. So, well, and, and there's a, I, I, I take notes in my guests talk because everything doesn't wind up, you know, sure. in the, uh, in, in the paperwork <laughs> that supports the podcast, everything doesn't wind up in there because it can't, you know, there's no possible way. Right. Um, the challenge I have with Achebe's uh, critique is it's written in 1975. Um, his critique would have, no, well, and, and he would assert, and, and rightly so, by the way, he couldn't have written his critique in 18, whenever the book came, the book published, it was uh, 18... Uh, Heart of Darkness was 1902. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit about more about that. More about that sure. because I believe that that I believe that Heart of Darkness. This is part of the complication with Heart of Darkness that I think Achebe misses, um, and I think that we as moderns, postmoderns, miss too. I because there's a fundamental third layer underneath here, but the critique I would have of, of Achebe is this. Um, it's easy to be critical of the past when you live in the future because you have the benefit of 73 years of extra information and knowledge that they did not have. It's really hard to let the text be what it is and to contextualize it in its own time. Now, we try to do that on this podcast here. So um, is Conrad a racist by 2022 terms? Sure. Sure. But so what? Like he doesn't live in these terms. He doesn't live in this time. Um, the um, the the linguist John McWhorter 
<laughs> infamously says the past is a place that we don't visit. It's a country we don't go to anymore. We, we don't live there anymore, right? Um, we are very much presentism. We are very much present, present focused. But because we revisit Heart of Darkness, and I'm going to talk about Apocalypse now. Don't worry, folks. All my film folks who are out there who know I'm a giant film file. <laughs> don't worry. We're going to talk about <laughs> we're going to talk about Apocalypse now um, on the podcast today. Um, and we're going to talk about Joyce Carol Oates' critique, by the way, of Apocalypse Now, because she was not a big fan of that. And we did try to get her on the podcast, by the way. We wanted to hear from her. Um, we did reach out to her. Um, since we don't live in the past, we do live in the now. And we keep revisiting the past in order to grab new things from it. Um, is it difficult to figure out what to sift out and what to keep? Is that a hard thing? particularly with a text like Heart of Darkness? I don't... I don't know that it's difficult to sift out. I think, um, coming back to Achebe, I'm sorry, can you hear those notifications? I don't know how to stop them. I hate for them to intrude into the podcast, but that's what's going on sometimes is, in the it's background. All, it's, all, it's an organic conversation. Yeah, so yeah. The computer's going to organically go, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to, it's going to, yeah. So, um, what I was going to say is that uh, Achebe's argument is worth a read. Mm -hmm. and, oh, yeah. and he is definitely correct to look back on Conrad's story and say, this isn't enough. Mm -hmm. This is a picture written by a European mm -hmm. um, that is not complete and it or not even um, close to filling in the humanity of who we are as Africans he would say so okay, yeah. for for that reason I think it's it's not just a worthwhile text for you know like what does it say about us um, as, as say a Western milieu or culture. Sure. What Achebe's real problem was, was this. And this is an act, this is, this is something that we all could be careful of. And like you said, this is a, a leadership podcast, right? Absolutely. What he says is Joseph Conrad in Heart of Darkness uses Africa merely as a metaphysical backdrop to explore his uh, European identity. And if that's the case, then he just says, we're more than that. We're not, we're not just props. Mm -hmm. We're not just backdrops, right? We are more than that. And so I love what he does. He says, I'm not just going to become part of the criti critical critique, um, you know, highlighting the problem. He goes, I'll provide a solution. And he writes, things fall apart mm -hmm. and then no longer at ease. So uh, I don't, blame him at all you know he's one of those people who, who looks at the text and says okay this is great everyone's everyone's already on the bandwagon of how awesome this text is right he says right but let's be critical of that let's think through it and he goes there's more to us than this so i think in terms of what we can take from conrad's wonderful story amazing story is that it does teach us some insightful uh, lessons, not just about, obviously not about Africa, mm -hmm. but, um, but it says so much more about us than it does about them. Kind of, if you're going to use that, by di that dichotomy. Okay. And okay. so, you know, when I look at heart of darkness, I look at it like, and what do I encourage my students to take away from it? I'm saying, um, what can we find? What can we learn about what he's saying about the us and the us versus them equation mm -hmm. because he uses the them mm -hmm. almost as a as just a um a foil uh yeah and and like like i said just sort of a a backdrop a prop yeah. you know as yeah. a tribute comes. well and there's there's a thing here with rivers too which i want to get into there's something metaphysical about yeah. the river piece um and it's not just the comparison of the river thames to the river congo Mm -hmm. It's literally rivers everywhere. I mean, I think of um, Mark Twain's Roughing It, 
<laughs> you know, or mm-hmm, mm-hmm. even um, Huckleberry Finn or Tom Sawyer. Mark Twain mm-hmm. was obsessed with the river. Um, and again, he was a river boatman. So like that's yeah. that's that's a thing there for him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, direct from his experience. But this conceptual idea of a river, um, yeah. rivers stand out in people's consciousness and geography influences culture. Yes. More deeply than we want to admit. And then culture, of course, is, <laughs> I even say this, um, upriver from things like politics <laughs> or even history. <laughs> uh, culture is upriver from all of that. There's a headwaters from whence all of this comes and geography does drive. And I'm not a geographic determinist by any stretch of the imagination, but it does loom large in the human experience. And I don't think mm-hmm. we've fully gotten our arms around why that is. And I worry that in our technical time, when we are more disconnected than ever before from the natural world, particularly those of us who live in urban areas, even moderately urbanized areas, um, we have, a, we. you said metaphysical, I would go so far as to say spiritual connection to the river. And I'm not saying we worship the river. I'm not going that far. But what I'm saying is there are things that connect us mm-hmm. that then pop out in our culture later on. And you can see this in all types of different writings, all the way from the Old Testament. Um, when Moses <laughs> when Moses led the Israelites um, through the uh, through the um, through the desert after um, crossing over the river and you know the river parted, uh, well the sea parted. Um, and the Egyptians drowned, <laughs> you know, all the way to Egyptian culture, and I, I shouldn't say all the way to, but including Egyptian culture, where the river, the Nile River, mattered quite a bit, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. not only as a waterway, but also as a place of, again, mysticism and spirituality in an Egyptian mm-hmm. context, to the Volga River in Russia, speaking of current geopolitical events, which again, not a political podcast, but geopolitical events, the River Volga makes quite a bit of difference in Russia. Of the Yangtze River, the Yellow River, the Amazon, the Mississippi, and of course the River Congo and the River Thames. Rivers matter. And we see this in Apocalypse now, even going down the boat, going down the river on the boat. Mm-hmm. So there's a dynamic here that I think Conrad is tapping into that we don't fully talk about in culture. Mm-hmm. Uh, and geography drives some of this construction that you were just talking about. Mm-hmm. It's really interesting to watch this play out. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, add to it the, the Ganges, add to it the Danube, add to it the Seine, uh, add to it the River Styx. Correct. Right? I mean, it goes, it's, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? So and not just the Tigris and Euphrates in, in Western culture, but um, but even even deeper, you know, there's there's a river in the underworld, right? Right. The place of the, the place of the dead. Yeah. The, the notion that rivers are so important and um, crucial, significant, just woven within the, the fabric of our consciousness and history, but it becomes an archetype, right? Also, right. you know, to kind of use union terms, the, the notion of, of movement, dynam, dynamism, um, growth, uh, as opposed to stagnation and um, death. Right. Yeah. Speaking of the map and the territory and what's on it, back to the book, back to Heart of Darkness by <laughs> Joseph Conrad. And just a little selection here, talking about the river. This is Marlowe speaking at the beginning of his story. Now, when I was a little chap, I had a passion for maps. I would look for hours in South America or Africa or Australia and lose myself in all the glories of exploration. At that time, there were many blank spaces on the earth, and when I saw one that looked particularly inviting on a map, but they all looked like that, I would put my finger on it and say, when I grow up, I will go there. The North Pole was one of those places I remember. Well, I haven't been there yet and shall try and shall not try now. <laughs> the glamour's off. Other places were scattered about the hemispheres. I have been in some of them, and, well, we won't talk about that. But there was one yet, the biggest, the most blank, so to speak, and I had a hankering after true by this time it was not a blank space anymore and it gotten filled since my boyhood with rivers and lakes and names and it ceased to be a blank space of delightful mystery a white patch for a boy to dream gloriously over it had become a place of darkness 
but there was one in, there was in it one river especially a mighty big river that you could see on the map resembling an immense snake uncoiled with its head in the sea its body at rest curving afar over a vast country and its tail lost in the depths of the land and as i looked at the map of it in a shop window what fascinated me as a snake would a bird a silly little bird then i remembered there was a big concern a company for trade on that river dash it all i thought to myself they can't trade without using some kind of craft on that lot of fresh water steamboats why shouldn't i try to get charge of one I went along Fleet Street, but could not shake off the idea the snake had charmed me. You understand it was a continental concern, that trading society, but I have a lot of relations living on the continent because it's cheap and not so nasty as it looks, they say. I'm sorry to own, I began to worry them. This was already a fresh departure for me. I was not used to getting things that way, you know. I always went with my own road and on my own legs where I had a mind to go. I wouldn't have believed of it myself, but then, you see, I felt somehow I must get there by hook or by crook. So I worried them. The men said, my dear fellow, and did nothing. Then, wouldn't you believe it, I tried the women. I, Charlie Marlowe, set the women to work, to get a job. Heavens. Well, you see, the motion drove me. I had an aunt. A dear, enthusiastic soul, she wrote, and I quote, It will be delightful. I am ready to do anything, anything for you. It is a glorious idea. I know the wife of a very high personage in the administration and also a man who has lots of influence with, etc., etc. She was determined to make no end of fuss to get me appointed skipper of a river steamboat, if such was my fancy. The point of this podcast... It's to talk about hard things. And the hardest thing to talk about is the dichotomies of leadership and the fundamental tragic nature of humanity. Now, typically, people divide up into two philosophies on this in general. Some people believe that in the Rousseauian idea that everywhere society is flawed and man is the victim, the blank slate, such as it were, of a fallen society. But then there's another, some would say darker idea that every man will pay for his own sins and that there is no group salvation and men are fallen and that's just it that's the tragedy of life and well the author joseph conrad who voices marlowe was according to the writer of the introduction to the edition the Zygna classics edition of heart of darkness that i have joyce carol oates he was according to her quote well, not quoted, not according to her, but she wrote a little bit about his history. And she said this. She said, um, he had been appointed captain of a river steamer on the Congo in 1890. Ominously, his predecessor had been butchered by native Africans and his body left to rot unburied in the jungle. Conrad's difficult four-month adventure documented faithfully in Heart of Darkness left him near death, devastated with dysentery and fever. His health was broken for the remainder of his life. Conrad's predilection for extreme pessimism... That's where you get the whole individual versus group idea. Depression, that's where you get the whole individual versus group idea as well. And anxiety, which is a disease of our modern time, would seem to have exa been exacerbated by his physical condition. In May 1891, for instance, following his return to Europe, he confided in a letter to a friend, I am still plunged in deepest night, and my dreams are only nightmares. Turns out that Conrad was as complicated as any other creative who walks around in the world today, lamenting the historical past. There's a lot of stuff going on with Joseph, and it is exemplified in that excerpt that I read. And what struck me about it is because as a child, I was the kind of kid who sat on the floor and looked at maps. We had a big... We had two maps in my hallway in my house um, that I grew up in and in an undisclosed location, in case any of you are wondering. And on that hallway, on those maps, on one side was a map of the United States. And that's when I really began to realize as a child just how big the country was that I had been born into. And then on the other side of the wall was another map that was a map of the world. Now, I've replicated this setup for, for my kids in their house so that they would be raised seeing the world and seeing their own country such as it is, right? 
Geography is seductive, and there are blank places on the map. Not as many as there were even in Conrad's time, and even in his time, he said that there were fewer than there had been in the time before him. Uh, human beings expand out exponentially, and though those places may be blank because we haven't, the ones who are observing the map haven't been there yet, it doesn't mean that there aren't people there. Just look at the Native Americans in the American West. But it does make it complicated for leaders because in our own heads, the map is sometimes confused with the territory. And so the question becomes, at the moment, what can we learn about complication and avoiding the seduction of easy answers <laughs> to human problems from heart of darkness? Because there's a seduction there, right? It's easy to look on the map of human problems and just go, well, there's a blank space there. We'll just fix it. It'll be fine. What, is Con what would Conrad say to us about that? The, the text that you um, read earlier, just you stopped just short of, of the quote that answers that question. And, I did. and uh, so if you don't mind, I'd like to just read what, what Conrad says. Yeah, go ahead. And uh, it's a it's not that that long. It's just a mere paragraph, uh, not even a whole paragraph. But it, I'm going to start halfway through a sentence. It says, "For there is nothing mysterious to a seaman, unless it be the sea itself, which is the mistress of his existence and as inscrutable as destiny. For the rest, after his hours of work." a casual stroll or a casual spree on shore suffices to unfold for him the secret of a whole continent. And generally he finds the secret not worth knowing. The yarns of semen have an effective simplicity, the whole meaning of which lies within the shell of a cracked nut. But as has been said, Marlowe was not typical if his propensity to spin yarns be accepted. And to him, the meaning of an episode was not inside like a kernel, but outside, enveloping the tail which brought it out only as a glow brings out a haze. In the likeness of one of these misty halos that sometimes are made visible by the spectral illumination of moonshine. That quote is Conrad's encapsulation of the way truth, the way reality is, is not always uh, an easy answer, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. In other words, you ask the question, what can we learn about complication and avoiding the seduction of easy answers to human problems. Yeah. Well, for Marlowe, he doesn't see things, I, I believe, as black or white, mm -hmm. easy or hard, right? I think he, he, uh, he Marlowe, the character, yeah. is, um, uh, he's very much like sailors, he, you know, he, he does what sailors do, tells tales, mm -hmm. right? Um, but, the, but what Conrad says is for most sailors, life is pretty simple and simplistic in, in the sense that their life is not really um, that complex in the sense that they are always in one place and it's moving, but, and they'll get off and, and be the tourist for a second and enjoy you know, R&R &R on, on shore, but then they get back on the boat and, or the ship and then they move on. But, but Marlowe was different, Conrad says, and he, uh, except for his propensity to spin tails or spin yarns, he, he was a much more complicated figure, and he saw the world much differently um, yeah. and, and broadly and, and complexly, right? So I think that for him, even the way he tells his tale is not one in which you can say oh here's a nut and you crack it open here's the answer mm -hmm. here's the here's the kernel here's the kernel instead he's, he uses words like 
misty, spectral illumination, moonshine. Right? Hazy. <laughs> Outside, <laughs> hazy, right? Yeah. In other words, it, it's not something that, that we can uh, grasp as, as a, a simple, easy answer. And so his, his I mean, I'll use a, a, a phrase that maybe your audience is very familiar with, but, um, but you don't hear it every day. Mm-hmm. And it's the notion of epistemological anxiety. Ah, there yeah. we go. Yes. It, it's yeah. not, it's not that it's a, uh, it, it's a, it may be a kind of a contemporary phrase, but it's an old dilemma that's been around as long as people have. And that is the notion of not just what is truth, but can you know truth? Mm-hmm. Can you know an answer? Is there an answer, right? Is there a, is there a, uh, is there a quote unquote right answer to the, to the questions of life? Right. That's an epistemological anxiety. It's like, I, I'm not sure that we, we can know something. Right. And so uh, that's all I'm saying is, is that's what epistemological anxiety is. The idea of, you know, studying belief systems, but then having an anxiety of whether or not the belief systems suffice. Right. And, and I think Conrad is really grappling with that that dilemma. And, and so I love, that's one of the reasons I love the story too, is because Marlo, he's, he's, he's kind of a walking contradiction in some ways, yet he's very ascetic and very, um, you know, kind of almost mystical in his wisdom. But um, he starts off the, the text by saying something to the effect of, I hate the test a lie. But then later on in the story at the end, he actually says, man, I, I told a good whopper. Um, he actually he calls it a lie when he says that he answers the uh, the fiance's question. Mm-hmm. What were his last words? What were Kurtz's last words? Uh, and he he's he, he's like befuddled and and he tells her that instead of the horror, the horror, it was your name. Your right? name. And yeah, so yeah. my question becomes, knowing the complexity of Marlowe and his way of thinking and the way of telling truth or, or telling a yarn mm-hmm. was he lying or not well and that and that goes back to i love the poem by robert browning the child roll into the dark tower came oh yeah and the first one of the first lines in there was my first thought was he lied in every word and you think about that and the, and the writer stephen king who we've quoted on other podcasts before in his book on writing makes this point about not necessarily epistemological anxiety, but he talks about how fiction is more truthful than truth because there are things you can say in fiction that you could never place the ball truth of out in the world Yeah, because not only would people not accept it, but you would have a riot on your hands. <laughs> You'd collapse yeah. the entire culture. And so in yeah. fiction, we can hide all of this anxiety and yet we live in a time, and this is the dichotomy that Conrad was at the beginning of with, and this is why I mentioned Darwin and Freud. Yes. He was at the beginning <clears throat> of a moment that we are now on the back end of where not science, but scientism promises us that we will know the bald truth. And of course we buy it because we live in a gee whiz world. Joseph Conrad would be amazed by Microsoft Word. <laughs> <laughs> you know he would be yeah. amazed by netflix um you know um I, I was joking about this in another podcast talking about alexander hamilton right and how hamilton gets himself a musical whereas thomas jefferson gets himself a genetic test like that <laughs> if jefferson were alive today he'd be like yeah of course that makes perfect sense <laughs> you know um technologies that they could not have imagined have been brought to us by science over the oh, long, yeah. the long, sordid 20th century. Yeah. And yet we're no closer to actual truth. Yeah. We are. Well, we can we can split the genome, but we don't we don't know we don't know what's true. And so we've confused our ability, and this is my problem with secular atheism at a at a core level. We we can do the science thing, but that's not truth. And we also can do the whole deconstructing thing from Derrida where there's multiple truths, 
but that's even worse because now you can't make a decision about what specific truth or <laughs> not you can't make a decision. And this is why we're doing this episode in the month where we're also doing um, Nietzsche and Nietzsche. We're looking at Homa at Homer. Yeah. Um, and we're looking at um, we're looking at some other authors in this month. And this is where this podcast sits. But Nietzsche thought we could build our own values out of our own experience and that that was going to be the way out of the epistemological anxiety. Uh, no, no, we, we, we've actually proven we can't, we can't build our own values out of ourselves. And so what do we do? And I think Conrad was at the beginning of this idea. This is the beginning of this idea in, in 1902, uh, because thus spake there was published in 1898 or 1899. Um, Freud was really getting his his work starting to roll in Vienna and was starting to publish widely. Um, and then... Um, yeah, Interpretation of Dreams is 1899, 1900. Right, exactly. So Conrad would have been exposed to all of these ideas. Mm -hmm. And a, a generation before, Dostoevsky had already said in Russia that if there is no God, that anything is permissible. Okay. But we're we're in 2022. We're at the back end of all of this. <laughs> Again, just like just like Chio Ashebe, we now have the experience that they never got. They were at the end of something, right? They were at the end of epistemological belief. Now we're at the end of epistemological, uh, the deconstructing <laughs> of epistemological belief and of existential belief. We've deconstructed that all the way down to nothing. And my concern for leaders is. Now we got a big blank hole experience. And I think that that leads to just a lot of our modern anxiety, particularly in leadership, because we don't know what to fill it with. Well, the ethics of deconstruction aren't necessarily immoral. And they're, that's, the, that's the part of the complexity of, say, a postmodern answer, is that, right. that it's not saying uh, in the gap, fill it with lasciviousness and and hedonism right oh, right yeah right. yeah it's agnostic so, on what you fill with fill the gap with which which again frustrates human beings because human beings want you to say something <laughs> right right we, we want that kernel right yeah. give, me, give me that kernel yeah. um give me the secret that's not right. worth knowing right or give me that. yeah yeah give me the you know yeah tell me the answer to the questions please you know and right. the thing is is every I've come to understand um, that what we do as humans is we we look for answers to those big questions in life, and and the the podcast does a brilliant job of approaching those questions. Mm -hmm. Right. The thing is, is what we do is we tend to we latch on to pre digested pre-packaged answers mm -hmm. and that's i think one of the thing that's things that's so charming about our our existence mm -hmm. is some of us glom on to um political answers some of us glom on to you know religious answers some of us glom on to um say i don't know creative artistic answers you're right like we go to to various parts of society but we're looking for similar things and that is the you know kind of group acceptance or or the fact that someone has created this uh, set of answers for us that we can then we can we can it's a shortcut you know we can kind of like buy the whole book that's already had had all the answers filled in for us, or we can, you know, the mad libs, we can kind of fill in our own and, mm -hmm. you know, create kind of a strange. Or we can listen to the podcast where two guys are talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. One thing you said about fiction, you know, and I, I like to say this as well to my students is um, fiction is lies that tell the truth. Oh, that's good. Okay. And, yeah. um, and so, what is the truth? You know, so then it comes that yes, then we can get into all those epistemological kind of anxiety kind of question, right? Like the can there be truth and and what is truth and is it just a capital T or little T's or um but still like you said, there are you there are universal um 
I don't know if they're called answers, but there are universal principles, something. Yeah. That you can tap into and say that that's, that feels right. That seems right. And so for example, um, when I teach heart of darkness, one thing that, that you can come away with Mm -hmm. is, um, hopefully a sense of empathy, Mm -hmm. right? Or hopefully a sense of the dangers of arrogance, right? Mm -hmm. Or hopefully you can come away with, with a lesson about the need for some form of restraint, Mm -hmm. right? Where does that come from? Well, you know, and, and so you, you mentioned Nietzsche, it's like, maybe he's also revealing the vulnerability of the ubermensch mm-hmm. right i mean mm-hmm. in other words mm-hmm. these 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 idols these i mean look at it even today's political situation sure. you, you, if you embrace a man or a movement with almost an idealistic fervor that <laughs> there there be, it becomes to the point where you are blinded to the humanity, right. right? And you end up accepting the flaws as if they are part of the perfection, mm-hmm. right? And so that's one of the dangers that Marlowe is uh, illustrating for us. Like, watch out. You can start to really admire Kurtz, but when you start to tip into the realm of uh, worshiping Kurtz, <laughs> so yeah. that's problematic yeah, we, it's yeah to use a modern term <laughs> that i that i i struggle mightily with that word uh <laughs> just struggle mightily because yeah. words mean things oh it drives me crazy anyway yeah. <laughs> um the you're right the root of epistemological anxiety i mean again it's biblical right i mean Pontius Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? And Jesus just stood there and looked at him, which was a truly excellent question in that moment, right? If I'm going to kill the alleged, from his perspective anyway, the Roman perspective, uh, and and they didn't even get into all that. If I'm going to kill this rabble rouser who the Jews are alleging is a heretic, and I don't even know what that means, and yet this person comes and tells me, getting directly out of Jesus's mouth, I have come to bring truth into the world. Pilate doesn't know what to do with that. He's a leader. He's a leader of men. He has no clue what to do with that answer, which I, which by the way, I don't think a lot of us now would have a clue what to do with that answer. (laughs) (laughs) This is the modern struggle against Christianity. This is the struggle that Nietzsche had against Christianity 120 years ago. I don't know what to do with Jesus. No, he threw Jesus out with the bathwater. He liked the Old Testament a lot more than the New Testament, which, okay, fine. But, like, what is truth? Well, I've come to bring truth into the world. What does that mean? That's, that's, and, and then, of course, he stands silent, which is a brilliant answer. <laughs> it's a yeah. brilliant, you got to figure it out. Congratulations, yeah. right? You are the one that has to figure this out. And yet, you're correct. We don't know how to find that. We don't know, and, and you're right, you know. Derridian deconstructionism, which I studied in college, I read all of Derrida and Foucault and all those guys. Okay, fine. Um, sure, it's agnostic, but even being agnostic on what you fill the hole with, you're making a decision about what you fill the hole with. Like you just are. You're saying you're making a statement by saying nothing at all. Okay, leaders have to figure out how to link all that together first for themselves, and that's why on this podcast we say leaders got to start with self awareness. You got to figure that out for yourself and then transmit that out to others, right? Mm -hmm. In real material terms and real practical ways that people can understand. The other dynamic you have is how people actually behave in the world versus what they say. So there's a, there's always a dichotomy there, right? You know, we say we have, and we're having an existential crisis. We, we don't use those words, but we say that, and yet we strive mightily in our behavior to maintain lasting relationships with other people. We, we, we just do, we, we strive to maintain marriages. Um, it's a real problem when marriages fall apart. Um, we know that 
one of the number one causes of suicide and depression, particularly in the modern era among grown men, is a divorce. Divorce and bankruptcy. Those are the two big ones. Why would you kill yourself over a divorce if nothing matters? If there's just existential nihilism that's going on? Well, because something does matter. It was that relationship. That was the thing, right? Um, or we know that individuals, when they go into online relationships, actually behave worse. Jonathan Haidt has tracked all of this in The Righteous Mind and a number of other works. Individuals behave poorly when they are allowed to be in anonymous online environments. Why is that? Because when there's anonymity, now the other thing, the opposite thing comes in, and usually that thing is a negative. And it's interesting that Marlowe at the beginning talks about snakes and it compares the river to a snake. That's a very, again, a Jungian archetype. Yeah. And snakes are related to dragons in Jungian archetypes, and you have to fight the dragon of chaos. That was what Joseph Campbell later on got from the Jungian right. archetypes, that you have to fight the dragon <clears throat> of chaos in order to, uh, and even the Egyptians believed this, in order to go down and rescue the soul of your dead father, go down and rescue Osiris from the underworld and bring him back up and restore him. And I wonder, this is why we're doing this podcast in this way this month, I wonder how much of the modern world needs to go back into the dead underworld in the 1890s and rescue its dead father. Well said. Back to the book. Thank you. Back to the book. Just just some thoughts I have. Just some things I'm thinking, right? Just some things I'm thinking. Yeah. Back to the heart of darkness. Um, I'm going to skip over this paragraph. I'm going to go right here. Um, so there, he, he comes, he's, uh, Marlo's relating um, how he has come across a path leading up a hill to a um, to uh, some decaying machinery, and he's describing what he is seeing along the path as they are building a railway through the jungle. And he starts with this: a slight clinking behind me made me turn my head. Six black men advanced in a file toiling up the path. They walked erect and slow, balancing small baskets full of earth on their heads, and the clink kept time with their footsteps. Black rags were wound round their loins, and the short ends behind waggled to and fro like tails. I could see every rib. The joints of their limbs were like knots in a rope. Each man had an iron collar on his neck, and all were connected together with a chain whose bites swung between them rhythmically clinking. Another report from the cliff made me think suddenly of that ship of war I had seen firing into a continent. It was the same kind of ominous voice. But these men could by no stretch of imagination be called enemies. Hmm. They were called uh, criminals, and the outraged law, like the bursting shells, had come to them an insoluble mystery from the sea. All their meager breasts panted together, the violently dilated nostrils quivered, the eyes stared stonily uphill. They passed me within six inches without a glance with that complete death-like indifference of unhappy savages. Behind this raw matter, one of the reclaimed, the product of the new forces at work, strolled despondently, carrying a rifle by its middle. He had a uniform jacket with one button off, and seeing a white man on the path, hoisted his weapon to his shoulder with alacrity. This was simple prudence, white men being so much alike at distance that he could not tell who I might be. <laughs> I actually chuckled at that. He was speedily reassured, and with a large white rascally grin and a glance at his charge seemed to take me into partnership in his exalted trust. After all, I was also part of the great cause of these high and just proceedings. Instead of going up, I turned and descended to the left. My idea was to let that chain gang get out of sight before I climbed the hill. You know I am not particularly tender. I've had to strike off and to fend off. I've had to resist and to attack sometimes. That's only one way of resisting without counting the exact cost according to the demands of such sort of life as I had blundered into. I've seen the devil of violence and the devil of greed and the devil of hot desire. But by all the stars, these were strong, lusty, red-eyed devils that swayed and drove men. Men, I tell you. But as I stood on this hillside, I foresaw, I foresaw that in the blinding sunshine of that land, I would become acquainted with a flabby, pretending, weak-eyed devil of rapacious and pitiless folly. How insidious he could be. Two, I was only to find out several months later, and a thousand miles farther, for a moment, I stood appalled, as though by a warning. Finally, I descended the hill, obliquely, toward the trees I had seen.
this passage, this piece I pulled out, because there's a lot of parallels here between what Marlowe is describing in this, and this is not hyperbole, um, and I suspect that Conrad probably directly witnessed this, this enslavement of a peoples in order to build a road. Now, this is not something that's unusual as a vision to see. You see this on news reports even today of uh, natural resources being pulled out of various places on the African continent, uh, most notably in the last 25 years, will be in people's historical memory, uh, images that they may have seen on CNN of children digging for blood diamonds in the ground. But it's also paralleled in a lot of other places. And the, 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 the number one place where this was paralleled was in the movie by Francis Ford Coppola, Apocalypse Now, in 1979, where a CIA officer, well, not even really an officer, a CIA-hired army assassin portrayed by Martin Sheen, was sent upriver, um, just like Marlowe walked upriver, uh, to kill the mad special forces Colonel Kurtz, played by Marlon Brando. At one point in the film, an incident occurred in the film, and Sheen states in the voiceover, I love this, he says, and I quote, never get out of the boat. It's after a violent incident occurs. Never get off the boat. Absolutely goddamn right. <laughs> Unless you were going all the way. Kurtz got off the boat. He split from the whole fucking program. Now, Oates, in the introduction to my Signa Classics version of Heart of Darkness, critiques uh, apocalypse now and critiques Coppola's understanding of Conrad's purpose in the heart of darkness as well as Mar Marlon Brando's overacting and if you want to see what she said you can go read that but there is something that Coppola understood deeply in paralleling Marlowe's story of his journey down the river Congo in heart of darkness to the American experience of warfare and corruption in Vietnam and I think o Oates has missed it particularly because she's out of the same milieu as Coppola, and it's hard to see in your own generation, kind of, when somebody gets it right, I think. And this was the thing that Coppola got that Marlowe is getting to in his description of human beings going uphill, kind of like a river. The river, the land, the animals, even the weather, and we've talked about this already a little bit, can possess their own personality, their own drivers, and their own dynamics that can serve to cloud any leader's thinking. That's the thing Coppola got. But he didn't know how to say it directly, so he had to layer it inside of, well, fiction. And sometimes the safest place for a leader to make decisions from is the space of a piece of technology that's floating along in that thing that man has constructed. Sometimes the safest place is your house or your office as a leader, or at least you feel like it is. Because it can be a real challenge, right, to leave your office and go out and deal with those people, leave the cubicle, get out from behind the computer, which is what I tell leaders all the time. You want to leave people, get out from behind the computer, get off the boat, get out of the office, get off, leave the boat and go out on the river because the river is what you're scared of. The river of people, the river of experiences, the river of relationship, that's what you're scared of. Get off the boat. And then, of course, they respond like Martin Sheen did. Never get off the boat. <laughs> Not unless you're going all the way. <laughs> well, guess what, leaders? You are going all the way. You must go all the way with your people. Moment. Heart of Darkness has something to say about this tension between technology and nature. And again, Conrad was at the beginning of industrialism, right? He was at the beginning of all of this kind of stuff that was happening in the world. We're at the back end of the Industrial Revolution. What do leaders do with the tension between technology and nature? Two, two anecdotes come to mind. Um, one from my own life and then another from back to Conrad's text. Two different questions in a sense, but, but I just have to, to say it before I forget. And that is once I was on a trip, a road trip in, in the 90s, mm -hmm. um, where we left Fort Worth and drove all the way to the Texas-Mexico uh, border and then took a bus to Chihuahua and then took a rental car through the Sierra Madre Occidental and um, all the way to the Pacific coast 
And then we drove down along the coast to where ultimately we, we ended up in this little shrimping village known as Topolobampo. And my friends who we were driving with, uh, there were five of us in this car. The, the, the trip was so harrowing. Uh, El Camino, El Camino, uh, uh, El Camino a Topolobampo es muy peligroso was, was one of those uh, kind of uh, sentences we actually heard along the way. The road to Topolobampo is very dangerous, it's right? Very dangerous, yeah. And so, but the road from Fort Worth all the way to Topolobampo was incredibly harrowing and, and dangerous. But when we got to Topolobampo, one of my friends who was really one of the reasons we, we did the trip, we got out of the car and we looked at this beautiful bay and it was a sunny day and it was probably about 11 o'clock in the morning. So it was still just, it was just this beautiful nation morning day. It was just great. So he goes, all right, let's get back in the car. Got to get back home. <laughs> <laughs> and we weren't even we took a we, we took a picture and so i said no 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 no. we're gonna get one of those pong pongas is what they're the little boat yeah and we're gonna we're gonna rent the ponga for for an hour at least we're gonna be on the bay we're gonna get in the <laughs> we're not just gonna take a picture and get back in the car and go so we did. We went on the. We got a boat. We got a ponga, and we um, we ended up, you know, like boating out there and, and floating along where the dolphins were jumping out of the water. It was just magic. But then we got back in the car after we had, yeah, 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 yeah. and then we drove back. You know, drove back. turns out that was a very dangerous drive too. But my point being, you know, it's like there is, you know, like you mentioned, leaders leaders can't just stay behind their computer screen right they've got to get off the boat but they have to you know they have to get sometimes getting off the boat means you get into the boat right and right you know yeah. the bay you know like you're living you're not just taking a picture so you can look at the picture later to remember what you could have seen then at the moment but you instead took a picture of it right right um so so i think in one way you know there's it's it's you go to a concert i went to a paul mccartney concert recently and so many people are like looking at the concert through a screen. They're not going to look at that screen later. They're not going to watch the concert again later, but they have it on their phone. So they feel like they've been there, Yeah. but it's an illusion, you know, and, and Paul McCartney is constantly trying to encourage people to just live in the moment instead of taking the picture for the moment, like have it in your memory seared as a picture in your mind, as opposed to taking a picture a selfie or whatever, you know, and I think it's the same thing. We have this struggle with technology that we think it's going to en enrich our lives to the point of uh, some form of perfection. And when in reality, I think it, it keeps us from actually savoring the moment mm -hmm. and um, getting in the ponga and, and getting on the bay. Now, in terms of what Marlowe through Con, what Conrad through Marlowe is saying, is there is a tension between technology and nature, but we can't forget that we ourselves are nature too. We are, mm -hmm. we are the creator of technology, but human nature is also nature. Mm -hmm. And what he says is, as he's going up the river, he comes, he comes to a, a station. Yeah. We're in the river. Uh, one of the main boats that he needs to get all the way up into the way up into the interstate where Kurtz is, mm -hmm is the the boat is is at the bottom of the river you know because it's um and it needs repairs and what yeah. what it needs is to breathe needs to be repaired where there's been a breach in the hull and, mm -hmm. and he needs some rivets um to help create that and you know what rivets rivets do they they seal their they're a way of of Breathe, you know, like creating the the seal that that, but it's yeah, from the inside out. Right. Yeah. They're right? bonding the. They're the, bonding the. But yeah. They're bonding yeah. It's not like an outer okay. nut that goes into a. I mean, a screw. Right. Like right. on a bolt. I'm sorry. Yeah. Instead, the rivet is 
it, it, it's kind of from the inside out. Mm -hmm. So what, what he says is, um, uh, they were talking about Mr. Kurtz being a universal genius and, mm -hmm. uh, he did not make bricks why there was a physical impossibility in the way as I was well aware. And if he had, if he did secretarial work for the manager, it was because quote, no sensible man rejects wantonly the confidence of his superiors. Did I see it? Mm -hmm. I saw it. What more did I want? What I really wanted was rivets by heaven rivets to get on with the work, to stop the whole rivets I wanted. And he mentions later on that basically that's what we all need is rivets, you know, which, which is in a sense a form of technology, right? But it's how it's applied. And, that, and, and ultimately getting back to this notion that we are humans in, in nature where, you know, so Conrad is talking about human nature a lot. He's basically saying we need restraint in the sense of there's got to be an inner sense of restraint as opposed to a wanton letting go to the point where it doesn't matter. You know, like I, I remember being taught or told a long time ago that integrity is what you do when no one's watching. Right. Yeah. Right. And and Marlo, <laughs> he, he, he realizes, boy, there's a lot of no one watching. Yeah. Right. Right. And ultimately what he needs and what, what he's observing is everyone needs is, is a little bit of a you know, healthy dose of rivets. He also mentions a, a one moment in the text where there are, there's a, an artillery ship just lobbing, you know, bombs and missiles, uh, projectiles into the, into the jungle uh, indiscriminately. Mm -hmm. And, um, and he's basically saying, you know, that it just is absurd. There comes a point where um, the technology uh, that is so blindly driven is very destructive. Right. And well, so anyway, there's a lot, no, like yeah. I said earlier, it's not a kernel and there's a lot of, there's a lot of spectral yeah. illumination or, of moonshine. Right. But I think he, he is um, troubling the notion that technology, good, you know, you know, nature, bad, bad. you know, or, yeah. you know, it's like, if anything, nature is uh, complicated and, uh, and, and, I don't know know that he thinks that it should be tamed, but I think he's saying human nature does need some gardening. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and again, this is a this is a very old idea. I mean, Adam and Eve came out of the garden where everything was uh, idyllic and mm -hmm. amazing. And okay, let's strip the religious elements out of that story at a psychological level. What is, what is it? What is it psychologically saying about human beings? Well, it's psychologically saying that we seek to live in a place that is idyllic with, with, with our own internal nature, as well as the nature of the thing that is external to us. And that is the highest or one of the highest ideals that we seek to aim at, right? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, a snake enters the garden, <laughs> and then the whole thing goes away, right? And then the constant struggle for humanity, at least in recorded history, is how to throw the snakes out the garden. And the snakes come in a lot of different ways. You know, they come in the form of uh, technology. They come in the form of um, a misordering of the hierarchy of where things go, right? And again, these are all psychological things. They're not material necessarily. Um, they start in our heads and then they work their way out in concentric circles out to the larger world. And I don't want to I don't want to get too heady on this because this is something that's very concrete actually. So um you know, you're in the video version of this podcast, you will you you've seen consistently everybody who watches this consistently has seen my books, right? My books are ordered in a particular way on my bookshelf. It is not an accident. Um, I do that on purpose. I'm sending particular messages to people uh, with these books. I think about this intentionally, 
and this is one of the aspects that we talk about of, of intentional leadership, right? But am I thinking about it all the time every time I put on the camera? No. I, I thought about it once, and I'm done. Like, it, it's, it's set and forget, right? I don't need to go fiddle around with books all the things every single time I do a podcast episode. With that being said, there are podcasters out there who do that. <laughs> they fiddle with the background every single time because they don't have a set it and forget it sort of mentality because they're constantly focused on fighting that snake or layering it into many other snakes that they are trying to fight and trying to to grab their arm around that serpent of content that means something. The other dynamic that we see in here, and this is also why I picked this section to talk about, is uh, the dynamic of how we use other human beings um, in order to accomplish our goals and our human beings a means or an end. Um, mm. and, and this is something that we all, I mean, we struggle with today. Um, we see this in the debates in the United States anyway about um, pregnancy and abortion. We see this there, the political debates around that. We see this in debates around climate change. Um, and what and it's not really about climate change. I think we're all kind of on board that there is something happening with the weather and the climate. I think we're all on board with that. I think it's a matter of what do we do and are we going to be are we going to allow that human nature to merely play out or are we going to put structures and what kind of structures are we going to put around? What kind of boundaries are we going to put around that nature? And are those boundaries correct? Are they fair? Are they interesting? You know, it just the box. It's like a, it's like a babushka doll. You know, you just keep coming out, coming out, coming out, coming out. I mean, you go on forever, right? The other thing that we see in this, and this is the parallel to apocalypse now for leaders. And I loved it how you said it. There's a lot of no one watching. In apocalypse now, the reason they sent Martin Sheen up the river was because no one was watching Colonel Kurtz. He left the entire program. And and it's interesting because what the CIA tells Martin Sheen, the spooks, played interestingly enough by um, uh, Indiana Jones is actually in there. Yeah, <laughs> Harrison, Harrison spooks, Ford. Harrison yeah. Ford back in the day. But very young Harrison Ford. You're shocked by how young he actually was. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, he actually says, or maybe one of the other men in the room say, um, that Colonel Kurtz has an Coppola did this on purpose in his script. Uh, Kurtz went off the reservation. That's brilliant. Because what does that term mean? That means we've corralled you. We've placed you in order. We've, we've created a system of boundaries around you. And when you break that, you are rebelling against the order. And we cannot have rebellion against the order. You, you are now a snake in our garden. Mm hmm and we can't have that. And so the 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 totalitarian we, we we talked about Lenin actually on this podcast. Um and I am I am troubled by totalitarian thinking. Deeply troubled by totalitarian thinking. Now usually that comes out in political systems, but it can come out in a whole bunch of other different ways too. I'm deeply troubled by totalitarian thinking because it brooks no gray area. It just says if anything's outside of that, done. Mhm. Mm and that deeply troubles me because it's seductive and it's easy and it's 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 it's, it's ideologically capturing right? yeah but it doesn't actually solve the problem as a matter of fact uh, i'll make another literary reference here like in lord of the rings the eye of mordor looks for everything and also misses the most important things which is why I say on this podcast that the people who are doing the best leadership right now in the world today are not the president of the United States or whoever's running Davros meetings. Like, it's not those people. It isn't even maybe necessarily your mayor in your town or your congressperson. The person who's doing the best leading right now are people like Moment. They're the ones doing the best leadership right now, the hobbits, basically. <laughs> because yeah. there's so many of us that the eye of Mordor can't get us all. And if we just lead, then we it's, can create structures or revivify structures that are already old and dying. We can revivify them and create an order and a proper, not, maybe not create a proper balance, but move towards a more perfect balance and continue the project of moving that 
leadership forward at the individual level. Beautiful. As you can tell, I'm fascinated by this book. It's it's it is because it speaks to so many other different things as yes. well that we talk about not only on this podcast but that are occurring again in our in our time. And again, this is some this is why this book is timeless. This is why this one well, not book but this this novella is timeless. That is why this story will continue to be read because I don't see us getting around these things. I think it's a dynamic tension that ebbs and flows and ebbs and flows across the course of time psychologically with people and leaders have to recognize that as well the way they don't have maybe not ex existential anxiety um, about that back to heart of darkness the last sort of section here we're gonna talk a little bit about the man in black the <laughs> Kurtz is a Nietzschean metaphor. I, I, I do think Kurtz stands as a Nietzschean metaphor um, mm -hmm. in, in Heart of Darkness. And so uh, allow me to make my argument here. And by the way, as I always say on this podcast, we're not reading the whole novella. We're reading excerpts from it. Go get it. Go buy it. Go read it yourself. Go make notes in the margin when you get it. Um, pick up the Signet Classic version if you can get it used. Um, if you can get it new, grab that. Uh, get a physical copy. Don't read it on digital. Get a physical copy the way you can mark it up because you're going to want to. This is going to become part of your reach, <laughs> your leadership library. <laughs> <laughs> you got me fired up, man. <laughs> well, sorry, I stepped on your. <laughs> that's okay. The professor of English would like you to go buy a book, please. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, yeah, yeah, yeah. You said a hard copy too, so you can mark it up. It's like, what? Yeah, so it's such good advice. Well, so you can, well, and I mark up my books. You know, I have arguments oh, yeah. with the author in the margins, or I yes, have, or I have agreements with the author in the margins, right? Yes. Um, I highlight things in my books, right? And then I go back and I look at them again. Um, you know, we we're just talking about Nietzsche. I'm, I'm you know, we're, we're reading the Odyssey for for one of our podcast episodes this month, and and I've I'm talking to Homer, talking to Homer, right? And yeah. figuring it out, right? Mm -hmm. This is what you can do with books. This is what this is the power of this technology. Speaking of technology, yeah. of this technology in our time. Yeah. Back to my selection from Heart of Darkness, the last one here. We're going to talk about Kurtz here, and I quote again from Marlowe. Oh, go ahead. Your thought moment. You, you, it's one of those things. I, I probably put it in my notes earlier uh, when we were when I was thinking about today, um, and it's something I just want to make sure that it's it's inserted somewhere. And it's maybe it was in the technology nature question, but Marlow does a brilliant, uh, not Marlow, but Conrad using Marlow does a really good job of showing how what has been appropriated from nature is still very much part of our daily life. And some of that's very malignant in the sense of um, like King Leopold II uh, ravaging the Congo, killing up to maybe 10 million people in his uh, effort to, to not just get uh, rubber, um, but, but also ivory and so forth. But, but there's the, the, the constant presence of the results of that rapaciousness mm -hmm. uh, are around, all around us. Uh, and Mar uh, Marlo's even playing with, uh, he's, when he's talking, there are other people on the cruising y'all, the, the Nelly, mm -hmm. um, who are playing with uh, bones. Mm -hmm. It's ivory. It's dominoes, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, when he goes to visit uh, the intended, he's in, you know, he uh, goes into this beautiful home and there's a piano there and there's uh, billiard balls and there's uh, ivory, you know, there's, there's the evidence of empire there. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the appropriation of going into, a, you know, the, the jungles and bring, bringing back, whether it be rubber or whether it be the, the, the ivory that comes from a living creature, right? Mm -hmm. And um, ultimately, Kurtz, the, who we'll now be talking about, I think, in great detail, um, he hoards, but, but that 
the the piles and piles of ivory that he that he ends up amassing you know but but i think ultimately when you look at belgium for example and uh brussels you know uh, conrad mentions that it's like a a great monument to Mm -hmm. you know to to leopold but all these beautiful buildings and all all this kind of this shiny all they all look it kind of looks like ivory you know Mm -hmm. and what what he ultimately says is that all of it reminds him of kind of like a whited sepulcher Mm -hmm. um or a mausoleum you know and so just looking at the way empire is so destructive i think that's one of the brilliant ways that conrad shows us he is critical Mm -hmm. in spite of what anybody anybody Mm -hmm. later on may rightly say about you know um uh, conrad's foibles or flaws you know it's like he's doing a really good job if you're reading carefully you'll see just how part of how how deeply um in in meshed you know the 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 sausage of empire is yeah. part of our breakfast, right? Well, and, and and that to your point about from the, the the piece you read a little bit ago, that may be the secret that's not worth sharing. So, very few of us know how a car is made. We just get in our Toyota, turn it on, and drive. Uh, very few of us know exactly how our plumbing works. We just walk in our house, we turn on the water, boom, there it is. And by us, I mean us in the West, and I have to define the West as I always do, you know, Canada, North America, uh, certain parts of Western Europe, actually almost all of Western Europe, England, Japan, um, South Korea, that's the, the, the nominal West, increasingly India and Australia, well, Australia always in there, but um, India as well is coming up into that space. I'm talking about the English-speaking postmodern, that's what I mean when I say the West, okay, as opposed to other places, okay? But we don't think about, like, you and I both wear glasses. Uh, I used to make glasses for a living. Most people don't care about, yeah, most people don't care about how glasses are made. They, they don't care. They just want to know that it works. I don't think we're that much different than people in the past. The Rome, the average Roman didn't care how they got their bread. They just wanted to get their bread, which was their food, by the way, for the week. Go hang out at the circus and then get home before dark. Because the Roman roads were a mess after dark. <laughs> if you go back and look at history. Um, the average Mayan didn't want to know how sacrifice was happening at Tenochtitlan. They just wanted their crops to grow, and that was it. The average uh, Chinese person or didn't want to know about the sailing boats in the 14th century. They just wanted to know, did the rice crop come in, and can I feed my kids? There's a gap between what average people want and what leaders of quote unquote empires say they want. The average person in Belgium, the average person in England, the French were the worst, but the, and so were the Germans, but the average person in France or Germany, yeah, there's a piano. I, I, I don't know. Like, it's beautiful. And everything else is marketing. And we, we, we're we trying to raise our consciousness about these things in a globalized order. Yeah. And the interesting thing that's happening is globalism becomes unzippered, which is what's happening right now in our time, as glo- because of supply chain issues. It wasn't just COVID. This was happening before COVID. But because of oh, yeah. questioning the order, which is... What interestingly, one of our presidents did <laughs> was question the world order of binding us all together. And so now that is gradually becoming unzippered. We're actually seeing this in current geopolitical issues of all manners of all kinds. Yeah. But as the global order becomes unzippered, people's thought process becomes much more localized and the behavior of leaders becomes much more localized rather than globalized. Right. Is that a net good or is that a net negative? 
that may be a conversation worth yeah. having, not on this podcast, but someplace else. Sure, sure. <laughs> that may be and you mentioned Blood Diamonds and, you know, like, Absolutely. I mean, and there's a really great book. I can't think, I, I don't know who wrote it, but it's called Where Are You Wearing? But it's right. that mentality of, of, you know, understanding the source of what we live with and where it comes from and the price it's all those paid. that's why i mentioned the notion of sausage it's like i think one of the things that conrad is doing is he's saying you don't want to know how it's made right you know right. um well okay. it's well, really well, really ugly the yeah. labor for your nikes right you know, I used or to the challenge cell phones that we use, you know, right. You know, when, yeah. when I used to teach uh, business school classes, right. Um, I used to teach global strategic management class. And whenever we were talking about globalization, I would literally talk about their cell phones. And yeah. it was interesting. Not one student. And I, the vast majority of my students were from East Asia countries. Not one of those students cared. They didn't care. They were like, that's cool. And my relatives now make a dollar a day rather than a dollar a year. So shut up. This created opportunities for me. I, yeah. I don't want to hear about your guts and glory. I don't want to hear about your guilt. <laughs> Stop buying the phone if you're guilty. Right. Meanwhile, I'll buy it. <laughs> it's fine. I'll buy it because I know that my whoever is actually able to continue to have a job in a factory that you wouldn't work in. So these are all the dynamics of globalization, right? Which you can talk about that as jumped up colonialism and many times people have. But again, I think I think as things become more unzippered, um, which again, we can discuss whether that's a negative net or negative good, negative po or a net positive or a net negative. That might be a conversation worth having. Uh, but in general, people's thought, people's thought process has become much more localized, much yeah. more regional, much more, much more, um, um, I don't want to say paternalistic, that's not the word I'm looking for, but compartmentalized, right? Yeah. Into yeah. the time. And Conrad, again, was at the beginning of a lot of these things. He was at a weird transitional period um, that occurs once every hundred years when yeah. an entire society flips over. He was also at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, which had only been going on in England for about, what, 40 years, 50 years? So he was at the beginning of the scale up of industrialization. Yeah that eventually was going to bring environmental degradation, not just to Africa, but also to America and to England and to a whole lot of other places. So it's 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 complicated. Your Nikes yeah. are complicated. Your Toyota is complicated. And it's just as complicated now as it was back in, in 1902. Yeah. Thanks for the insertion. You're welcome. Yeah, absolutely. It's worth, well, it's worth talking about because it does tie into what Marlowe found when he finally got up the river. <laughs> right. And right. met Colonel Kurtz. Or, well, not Colonel Kurtz, but met Kurtz. Yeah. And all of this, you know, talking is beautiful. And uh, of course, it's very gratifying for me as a professor to get to, to visit um, outside of the context of a classroom, you know, about a text like this. But all these things that we're mentioning, um, there's a book by Charles Dickens called Hard Times, and there's a character in there called, her name is Sissy Jupe, and um, the, the teacher is trying to tell her about utilitarianism and, you know, the value of this, that, and the other, and ultimately talks about, you know, what happens if um, a, a certain amount of people die in a certain tragedy, and um, isn't it better that, you know, only a few people died instead of the, the, a whole lot more? And she actually says something to the effect of, well, it, it matters to the, to them, the ones who, yeah. who died. So in this whole conversation that we're having, I mean, um, even, even as kind of erudite and theoretical and, and, you know, literary, uh, evaluation and, you know, criticism that we're doing, and it's like, there was a real effect on human beings in yep. the Congo. And like I mentioned, 10 million uh, is, is, a, is an estimate of how many Congolese died uh, during this short period of time, this genocide. And people talk about, about Hitler as if somehow he created something out of nothing and was like a brand new um, you know, evil, but in reality, he, he was just a, 
I hate to say it, a good student of history and, and uh, you know, he, he learned a thing or two from, from the Congo, the, and he learned a thing or two from the United States and its subjugation and de de destroying of, of uh, the Native Americans. Um, what, 97%? You know, and so, in in other words, these these moments in history that are that are on the one hand incredibly productive, but on the other hand incredibly genocidal and destructive. It's like it really did matter to someone if they had their hand chopped off or not, right? Yeah. Like those well, people had a real. There was a real um, pain, and and so there was something. Whereas what a European made may only feel is like I'm playing pool in a, in a nice hall and here is the billiard ball, mm -hmm. right? Or I'm riding a buggy that has, um, you know, nice, you know, uh, uh, oh, what's the name of the, the rubber, vulcanized, oh, vulcanized rubber, yeah. you know, rubber. And, you know, it's like, it, <laughs> it's, um, it, it's coming at great, great cost to, to somebody at great expense. And, right. and we've, I think the long course of the 20th century teaches us that we have to count the cost and what the 20th century did at scale. You mentioned Hitler. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hitler's an easy target. Let's talk about Stalin. <laughs> Stalin right. twice, as, twice as many people as Hitler. I mean, without Stalin, you might, it is definitely arguable that you might not have a problem in the Ukraine, a problem, a war in the Ukraine right now. It, that That's an arguable, you can make that argument. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, well, Stalin came from somewhere, and that right. was Lenin. Now, Lenin never directly killed anybody in the pursuit of building a worker's paradise, which he stated repeatedly that that was what he was doing. But he signed orders that sent people to gulags. Yeah. Ideas, you talk about it being existential and then there being a real thing or uh, erudite and then there's being a real thing in the practical. Ideas have practical consequences. Uh, there's a great historian yeah. called Johnson who um, wrote a great book called Intellectuals. Now, he is a British historian. He does tend to lean a little bit to the right. But I say all that to say this. He actually went back and looked at how these people like Rousseau or like Marx um, or like Nietzsche, right, actually lived their real lives versus what they wrote down. Sure. And it is that dichotomy between I'm going to advise other people to do this versus how I actually live. Oh, oh and yeah. I'm not going to advise anybody to live the way that I actually live. Right. And so for leaders, the challenge is to, and I talk about this with leaders all the time in coaching, is how to close the gap between what you say and what you actually do. Yeah, yeah. There should be no daylight between those two things. And if you can't close that gap, you should be challenging yourself in every day, in every moment, not to show up authentically. That's a marketing term from social media. But to actually be the person that people are expecting oh, like to that. lead them. Yes. Right. So I used to tell my team back in the day when I had a much larger team than what I've got now, and they were much more localized. I said, you might, might see me yelling at my kids in Wegmans, for sure. <laughs> like, if you want to cross me Wegmans, you go see me having a conflict with my kids. And I'm going to deal with the conflict with my kids the same way I deal with the conflict with you. And you're going to watch it all play out. And that's fine. You're not going to see a gap. And I would never tell you to do something that I can't do myself, right? So... If I know that I have to close this gap, for sure you've got a gap as a leader. <laughs> yeah. And so we can talk a lot of good talk about, um, isn't it horrible that XYZ thing happens in XYZ sweatshop, but are you actually gonna stop buying Nikes? And by the way, this is what Nike knows. And before them, Leopold, Leopold knew this. Um, and before them, uh, and actually this comes out of Augustine, Augustine, this is not a new idea again. Mm -hmm. Augustine knew that there was always going to be a gap and Nike knows that there's always a gap and Leopold knew there was always going to be a gap between the actual lived outcome. And by the way, the people who benefited from Hitler getting rid of Jews who moved right into those shops and just took them over and ran them 
and Stalin knew that all those people who just moved into people into people's houses who were eliminated in gulags, at a practical level, people struggle not with the existential, theoretical, philosophical. They struggle with the closing of the gap between what they say and what they actually do. And leaders who are megamaniacal and totalitarian play in that gap. They rely on you not having the moral courage to close that gap. We read a book called The Unbearable Lightness of Being um, on the podcast. And we opened it with, yeah, and we opened it with the idea of the acidity of moral weakness. Because that's that entire book. It's about the acidity of moral weakness. It's about what happens at an individual level in that gap. Alexander Solzhenitsyn was fascinated with this idea. Um, what happens with this gap? Vaclav Havel, I'm reading The Power of the Powerless right now. What happens with the gap between the green grocer putting up the sign and what the green grocer actually believes? Yeah. And you got to close that gap as leaders. Close that gap. Close that gap. Close that gap. If you're worried about your vulcanized rubber, stop buying cars with vulcanized rubber. Don't well, tell me about it. Just stop it. Yeah. I mean, in eight. In 1898. In 1890, yeah, right, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> the thing is, is there's, the, the complicated answer is there are ways to get vulcanized rubber without chopping off Africans' hands. Correct, exactly. Right. So, I mean, there, there could, it could be done, like, the difference between free trade and fair trade, right? There's, right. so, I mean... The answer well, is it's been a long struggle for us to get to that difference yes. between free trade and fair trade. It's taken, yeah. and it is still a long struggle, you know. So, yeah. uh, you know, I'll use myself as an example. I am surrounded in this environment by um, by objects that have been made because of other people's labor. Do I think about what that labor is in the long haul? No. However. Where it matters to me, I definitely think about it. So, yeah. for instance, um, we do a ton of self-publishing in our organization, right? The third book just came out, 12 Rules for Leaders, The Foundation of Intentional Leadership. We explore some of these ideas in there. Go get it. Okay, that was my plug. Um, <laughs> but it is printed in Coppell, Texas, right? Coppell, Texas is about, from where you are, it's about two and a half hours east from where you are. There's a yeah. print facility there, right? Yeah. Okay. So who's getting a job because of paper that's imported to Coppell, Texas, basically? Where is that paper coming from? And then how many people are employed? And I, I did. I looked it up. How many people are employed in the making of this book at volume? Because I would rather have my dollars go to have it printed in Coppell, Texas, than have it go have those dollars go to the book being printed in uh, Mexico City. Are there people in Mexico City who need jobs? For sure there are. But that's not my, I, I don't necessarily, necessarily want my money to go there. Right, right. But it has taken us 120 years post-colonialism to get human beings to this point. Yeah. And so we human beings don't change at the speed of a tweet. We just don't change our behavior that fast. We, we cannot. And it is one of the arrogances of our time that we think we can. We just can't. We can have a hot take on Twitter, which is cool, I guess. <laughs> Right. <laughs> but actual practical behavior, yeah. forget it. Yeah. When tweeting becomes the action, there's problems. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, but I mean, it's representative of action. Right. And, and pe some people are lured into the uh, false sense of uh, achievement mm -hmm. when well, all they did was go, they hit the like button. Right. Right. Or they, or they dropped their 200 or 200 character hot take on. Right. About something. Right. Right. Now, I'm not going to let you get away with it because because I'm ahead. I'm from this area. Yeah, go ahead. They would they would have they would have you um, pronounce it Capel. Capel. That's right. They yeah. would. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're not from this area, so. I... <laughs> Thank you for correcting me. Yeah. Capel, well, I... anybody's listening in Capel. <laughs> okay. Moment got you. There you go. <laughs> Moment's got your back. I got your back. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's turn the corner here. Let's end with Colonel. Uh, Colonel, I keep going back to Colonel. Yeah, I Colonel. Got now in my head. Um, yeah, but um, let's uh, let's turn the corner and let's talk about you know the titular character you know other than Marlowe of this book you know and the brilliance by the way of Heart of Darkness is Kurtz is not introduced immediately 
Um, as a matter of fact, he's introduced gradually over the course of time. It's um, it's Anton Chekhov's pistol on the table, but it takes you all three acts of the play to actually hear the bang. Oh, that's so that's so good. Genius. <laughs> you no you. Oh, that, thank you. I mean, man, that I I I, uh, I will have to use that when I teach Heart of Darkness next time. That's go brilliant. Ahead. Yeah, and then yeah. tell him to go read Chekhov. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we read we read the the Champagne Wayfarer's Tale, um, and that's another example of Chekhov doing that doing that move. You know. Yeah. And Hemingway talked about Chekhov's pistol. Um, as a matter of fact, he did a whole story where he left the pistol on the table and never referenced it again. Oh, and wow. It was a poke in the eye to Chekhov. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, you know, later on, Hitchcock uses that that yep. whole technique to great effect. Of course, that's an Eisenstein thing of la, la, mise-en-scene. But the, the whole thing is Hitchcock, you know, now you've got people like Jordan Peele taking that that to to another level, so, you know. But, but yeah, it's, you're right that, that Kurtz is very gradually introduced to us and, and and the way he is he is introduced you are not allowed or able to to make a judgment until the very end right and to, yeah. then and even then you know it's a it's a it's a complicated judgment speaking of the end <laughs> yeah at lab back to heart of darkness at last he got angry, and to conceal the movement of furious annoyance, he yawned. I rose. Then I noticed a small sketch in oils on a panel representing a woman, draped and blindfolded, carrying a lighted torch. The background was somber, almost black. The movement of the woman was stately, and the effect of the torchlight on her face was sinister. It arrested me, and he stood by civilly, holding an empty half-pint champagne bottle, medical comforts, <laughs> with the candle stuck in it. To my question, he said Mr. Kurtz had painted this in this very station more than a year ago while waiting for means to go to his trading post. Tell me, pray, said I, who is this Mr. Kurtz? The chief of the interstation, he answered in a short tone, looking away. Much obliged, I said, laughing, and you are the brickmaker of the central station. Everyone knows that. He was silent for a while. He is a prodigy, he said at last. He is an emissary of pity and science, and progress, and devil knows what else. We want, he began to declaim suddenly, for the guidance of the cause entrusted to us by Europe, so to speak, higher intelligence, wide sympathies, a singleness of purpose. Who says that, I asked. Lots of them, he replied. Some even write that, and so he comes here, a special being, as you ought to know. Why ought I to know? I interrupted, really surprised. He paid no attention. Yes, today he is the chief of the best station. Next year he will be assistant manager two years more in. But I dare say, you know what he will be in two years' time. You are aware of the new gang. You are of the new gang. <laughs> the gang of virtue. The same people who sent him specifically also recommended you. Oh, don't say no. I have my own eyes to trust. Light dawned on me. My dear aunt's influential acquaintances were producing an unexpected effect upon that young man. I nearly burst into a laugh. Do you read the company's confidential correspondence? I asked. He hadn't a word to say. It was great fun. When, Mr. Kurtz, I continued severely, as general manager, you won't have the opportunity. He blew out the candle suddenly and we went outside. The moon had risen. Black figures strode about listlessly, pouring water on the glow. Whence proceeded a sound of hissing, a steam ascended in the moonlight, and the beaten, here we go, the beaten nigger groaned somewhere. What a row the brute makes, said the indefatigable, the indefatigable man with the mustaches appearing near us. Serve him right, transgression, punishment, bang, pitiless, pitiless, that's the only way. This will prevent all conflagrations from the future. I was just telling the manager... He noticed my companion and became crestfallen all at once. Not in bed yet, he said with a kind of servile heartiness. It's so natural. Ha, <laughs> danger, agitation. He vanished. I went on to the riverside and the other fellow followed me. I heard a scathing murmur in my ear. Heap of muffs go to. The pilgrims could be seen in knots, gesticulating, discussing. Several still had their staves in their hands. I verily believe they took these sticks to bed with them. Beyond the fence, the forest stood up spectrally in the moonlight, and through that dim stir, through the faint sounds of that lamentable courtyard, the silence of the land went home to one's very heart, its mystery, its greatness, the amazing reality of its concealed life. The hurt nigger 
moaned feebly somewhere nearby and then fetched a deep sigh that made me mend my pace away from there. I felt a hand introducing itself under my arm. My dear sir, said the fellow, I don't want to be misunderstood, and especially by you who will see Mr. Kurtz long before I can have that pleasure. I wouldn't like him to get a false idea of my disposition. Now I'm going to skip to the end a little bit here because we're running short on time. But I'm going to skip over and then move back a little bit here. Um, he meets Kurtz. And, uh, well, Kurtz doesn't make it. I can tell you how or why, but Kurtz doesn't make it. And uh, in his conversation with Marlowe, Kurtz says this. And it's kind of like what Colonel, similar in, in a lot of ways to what Colonel Kurt says in Apocalypse Now to Martin Sheen, but not exactly the same. And I quote directly from Kurtz. I had immense plans, he muttered irresolutely. Yes, said I, but if you try to shout, I'll smash your head with. There's not a stick or stone near. I will throttle you for good, I corrected myself. I was on the threshold of great things, he pleaded in a voice of longing with a wistfulness of tone that made my blood run cold. And now for this stupid scoundrel. Your success in Europe assure, is assured in any case, I affirm steadily. I did not want to have a throttling of him, you understand, and indeed it would have been very little use for any practical purpose. I tried to break the spell, the heavy mute spell of the wilderness, that seemed to draw him to its pitiless breast by the awakening of forgotten and brutal instincts, by the memory of gratified and monstrous passions. This alone, I was convinced, had driven him out to the edge of the forest, to the bush, towards the gleam of the fires, the throb of drums, the drone of weird incantations. This alone had beguiled his unlawful soul beyond the bounds of permitted aspirations. And don't you see the terror of the position was not in being knocked on the head, though I had a very lively sense of that danger too, but in this that I had to deal with a being to whom I could not appeal in the name of anything high or low. <laughs> I had even like the niggers to invoke him himself, his own exalted and incredible degradation. There was nothing either above or below him, and I knew it. He had kicked himself loose of the earth. Confound the man. He had kicked the very earth to pieces. He was alone. And I before him did not know whether I stood on the ground or floated in the air. I've been telling you what we said, repeating phrases we pronounced. But what's the good? They were common everyday words, the familiar vague sounds exchanged on every waking day of life. But what of that? They had behind them, to my mind, the terrific suggestiveness of words, heard in dreams, of phrases spoken in nightmares. Soul! If anybody ever struggled with a soul, I am the man. And I wasn't arguing with a lunatic either. Believe me or not, his intelligence was perfectly clear, concentrated, it is true, upon himself with horrible intensity, yet clear. And therein was my only chance, barring, of course, the killing him there and then, which wasn't so good on account of the unavoidable noise. But his soul was mad. Being alone in the wilderness, it had looked within itself, and by heavens, I tell you, it had gone mad. I had, for my sins, I suppose, to go through the ordeal of looking into it myself. No eloquence could have been so withering to one's belief in mankind as his final burst of sincerity. He struggled with himself, too. I saw it. I heard it. I saw the inconceivable mystery of a soul that knew no restraint, no faith, and no fear, yet struggling blindly with itself. I kept my head pretty well, but when I had him at last stretched out on the couch, I wiped my forehead while my legs shook underneath me as though I had carried half a ton on my back down that hill. And yet I had only supported him, his bony arm clasped around my neck, and he was not much heavier and the child. Nietzsche infamously said that if you stare into the abyss, you've got to be careful. The abyss stares back through you, or looks back through you, in some translations of the original German. Kurtz wound up getting wound up well well modern people will say that Kurtz wound up getting what he deserved and uh this is an easy judgment to make from 2022 when we are reading a book that says words we don't like and posits ideas that make us 
uncomfortable in the surety of our position, wherever we may be, happen to be. And uh, there's an interesting moment in, I made a comparison here, I made a connection here. There's an interesting moment in the movie Unforgiven, uh, directed by Clint Eastwood uh, back in the day. Uh, I think America's answer to Heart of Darkness was not necessarily Apocalypse Now. That was his ode to Heart of Darkness. America's answer to Heart of Darkness is, is Unforgiven. Um, and the titular character, William Money, he stands, he kills a bar room full of men who were um, seeking to bring him in or bring him to heal after engaging in the chaos of vigilantism, kind of like being his own Kurtz, at least in this small town. And with justifiable reason. I mean, they killed his friend Ned, right? in pursuit of the preservation of order. Anyway, after killing all the men, the sheriff of the town, who would be maybe maybe more like Kurtz in this anecdote, little Bill Daggett, played by the inestimable Gene Hackman, former Marine, by the way, hoo-ha. <laughs> he, uh, he, gets, he gets little Bill on the floor, right, after shooting him once, and, uh, and uh, he lays on the ground looking up at Clint Eastwood, who holds a shotgun on him. And little Bill says something that's amazing. I, I can hear Colonel Kurtz saying this. He says, I don't deserve this, to die like this. I was building a house. And William Money, again played by Curtis Clint Eastwood, in the last Western he's ever been in, says he said that that was his, well, his final word on the Western. William Money responds by growling, deserves, got nothing to do with it, and then blows the back of his head out with a shotgun. By the way, before just before he does that, Gene Hackman says to Clint Eastwood, I'll see you in hell, William Money. And William Money responds, yeah. You can either have hell on earth, or you can have hell inside. Either way, you're going to have hell. And I, I believe that nature is represented by the River Congo, the colonized people of Africa, and the animals even being harvested by Kurtz's rapacious paradise building would agree with Money's assertion, I think, that deserves got nothing to do with it. Um, in principle, if not necessarily in practice. One of the interesting things about Heart of Darkness is that there is no catharsis for Marlowe at the end of this. There is no coming together at the end of his narration. There's no resolution. There's no tied up bow, right? Um, there's merely the start of hopeless nihilism, the start of staring into the abyss and feeling it stare back through you. In addition to, as Moment has already mentioned, one more lie on top of another pile of lies kind of stacked like ivory or the bones of colonialized people. The lies stack up too. And he doesn't tell Kurt's wife's, Kurt's last words when he returns to notify her about his death. And of course, as we've already mentioned, his last words were the horror, the horror. How can leaders stand athwart history? How do they close that gap moment? Because it takes courage to stand athwart all of that and yell stop, to paraphrase from the founder of National Review, right? It takes a ton of courage to do that. And if you're not wired in that way, you can go off the path and fall into the abyss. So what can leaders take from Heart of Darkness? Mm. What, can they, what can they take about closing that gap? How, how do you do that? Yeah, and again, it's just so complicated. There's not an easy answer to that question. But I think one of the things that Kurtz teaches is not, it's not that he has this end like in Apocalypse. I mean, now Kurtz is sick. Yeah. I mean, oh, he's ill. He's, 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 but he's, I guess the question is what is the extent or degree or nature of his sickness? Yeah, right. is it psychological? Is it physical? Is yeah. it spiritual? Is it material? Is it emotional? Or is it 
or is Conrad trying to say the sickness of the lie goes all the way down, which, by the way, Alexander Solzhenitsyn would say much later on in the 20th century about the lie of communism. He would literally say that the only reason this survived was because everybody in the system lied to everybody else. That's it. Yeah. And, I mean, you look at George Orwell's 1984, you look at Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse-Five, you look at Joseph Heller's Catch-22. I mean, mm -hmm. there's the, it just keeps coming back to this, this notion of you got to have, you got to have a, a, a large structure of lies um, to make this destruction work <laughs> the way it does. Like clockwork, I mean, you look at oh, Vietnam yeah. and you look at uh, Apocalypse Now. Um, it, so, so I guess it, the question isn't necessarily about desert, like you said, about deserve and got nothing to do with it. Um, I think well, what, well, and we think, we think that this person is going to get with it. I mean, and that's what, that's right. What, like that's what's what coming to it. Yeah. Right. We always, and the fact of the matter is, and this is a very complicated not complicated this is a tragic that's a better word because that's a more yeah. accurate one this is a tragic um acceptance of human reality any uh, it's interesting again i was reading we were reading the arguments against the, the federalist papers and one of the arguments for the constitution uh a gentleman who he was colonel george mason uh, whom george mason university was eventually named after and he might have founded that university i'm not quite sure it doesn't matter point is he said that Slavery was a sin, and all sins bring national calamities. He actually said this in arguments about the Constitution, and he said, since individuals can't always be punished in nations, nations are punished, and eventually we will be. We need to be careful with what we're doing here. And, of course, there were other ideas in the room because disagreement isn't new to our time, and so some people said, well, slavery is just this, I don't care. Other people were like, yep, it's immoral, and what are you going to do? They were very pragmatic, right? And then you had other people who were like, we don't want to even talk about the issue. How dare you even bring it up? Mm. Proving, of course, that huh, current political divides in America aren't anything new. <laughs> None Truly. of this is new. This is all just du rigueur. This is sauce for the goose, right? But we see this also in this idea that, and it's a childlike idea, that people get... As Kid Rock said back in the day, people get what they put in. You get what you put in and people get what they deserve. No, mm. people don't get what they deserve. Sometimes people don't get what they deserve, good or evil. Yeah. And we, sh we, we don't have a good understanding. There's a whole bank of philosophy about this, about causal effects. Human beings are all messed up about causes. We just we just are. We, we don't yeah. understand ca the, the causal nature of the universe at a philosophical or even a psychological level. So when I say deserves got nothing to do with it, did Kurtz deserve to die like he died? Sure, maybe, but maybe he didn't. Maybe it was just a consequence, and it had no more moral right. or moral power there than that. Yes, but we don't like that. Right, that makes us, that makes us feel really icky. <laughs> yeah, one thing that 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 happened with Kurtz is he goes into the to the to his job with this zeal and he has this altruistic altruistic um uh idealism just this mentality of i go out there i'm gonna save the universe i'm gonna go out there and you know he creates this amazing essay mm -hmm. where he's gonna talk about you know going out and um bringing civilization to the primitive you know like indigenous folks of of africa and and it and it's the, this amazing kind of like uh manifest festo that he's like he's he's gonna just bring such growth and sophistication to these these you know like the 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 white man's burden you know yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, the rudyard kipling idea the rudyard yeah. kipling wrote um, and the thing about altru altru altruism is, um, there's an arrogance that, that, that some people ignore that says, I've got the answer and you need my answer. And therefore I will 
elevate you from your squalor mm -hmm. into this uh, this position of sophistication and maturity of culture and that's one of the things that achebe had a problem with um mm -hmm. but uh, but it is borne out in kurtz's own addendum his you, you remember what he writes mm -hmm. on that essay you know, yeah. exterminate Exter yep. the brutes the brutes you know? yep mm -hmm. and um and and the question becomes one of those complicated questions is not who the question is who who are the brutes yeah right. um and, is, and who gets to, and who is gets it them to or is it us right know? well and who gets to decide right we're, yeah we're, we're seeing this now as um i mean you know we're talking about heart of darkness so as various nation states on the continent of africa have have finally gotten past the infant mortality problem you are watching the rise of economic prosperity on various countries on the African continent. And again, not evenly, not collectively, but in general, the J curve is moving up and to the right. Are yeah. there outliers of problems? <laughs> Absolutely for sure. Zimbabwe is a notorious example <laughs> on, right. the, on, the, on the negative end. Um, on the positive end, Nigeria. Nigeria is going to be a major world power in the next 25 to 30 years. They are, they are going to be a major world power. Um, and good for them, by the way. They are going to leverage all sorts of different kinds of ideas. And it's going to be really interesting to watch from the perspective of past history. Yeah. It's going to be really interesting to watch how these African nations deal with each other. And I think what we will find, and this is because I'm a tragic pessimist when it comes to human nature very often, I think we will find that they will behave just as rapaciously as any other human beings have ever behaved. And that's their right. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? And like, going to, well, and what's going to happen is we're going to have lectures <laughs> from people who believe that they are culturally elevated. Oh, yeah. To those folks. Yeah. And we're already starting to see this happen a little bit in terms of drilling for oil in the Democratic Republic of Congo right. um, and in other places in Africa where they would like to drill for their own oil. Africans drilling for their own oil, selling the oil on the open market, and you're seeing Western and European, uh, Western American and European uh, individuals who are maybe more in favor of green energy, having mm. massive critiques for those people, and those people are basically telling them to, you can take, they're saying it this way, you can take your criticism, you can put it in a little bucket, and you can walk right back over there. Yeah. And I don't, I think that this is going to expose, again, getting back to that idea of the gap, the gap between what we say in shibboleths, yeah. what we put out that's marketing, and what we actually do. Yeah. People get real when they get uncomfortable. Yeah. It's weird. You can have yeah. all the high ideals you want, but people get real when it gets uncomfortable. So in the end what does kurtz mean when he writes exterminate all the brutes you know and right. and we i mean we we come to find some pretty horrifying things about kurtz and what he set up for himself yes deep 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 in the heart of the the jungle and one of the things that's hinted at is the notion of he allows them the 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 people there to worship him mm -hmm. and maybe even sacrifice humans to him and uh the whether it be sacrifice or punishment or something and he's now taken up with this um this uh paramour in in the jungle that raises her arms outstretched as yeah, they're yeah. leaving you know and ultimately um you know he's got this life going on with his second family you know what i mean like it's <laughs> It's a strange, it's a strange world, you know. The international Johnny Appleseed. Yeah, yeah he's doing. Yeah, yeah. um, but but in the end, you know, like the intended back at home is is just sure that that her her name is on his lips at the end, you know, right. and uh, in her in his heart, and she's got to know that she's got to she's got to be told that, um, and like I said before, I, I'm not so sure that the way Marlo recounts it, that he's, that he's telling a lie. I think maybe he's in his own way saying, well, the truth of the matter is 
the horror, the horror is kind of your name, you know? Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Um, But uh, yeah, it, it troubles. It's a troubling, it's a troubling text. And the, the resolution is very difficult, Mm -hmm. right? Because there is very little resolution. I mean, ultimately it's just Marlo sitting in the boat, kind of looking like a Buddha. I mean, in the pose, yep, in the uh, pose yes, right. Like and an just aesthetic. sort of, yep. just sort of, you know, <laughs> talking <laughs> and who, who's hearing him, you know, obviously. So that's the beauty of this text. Mm-hmm. Joseph Conrad writes the story, but then there's an unnamed mediator mm-hmm. telling us, the words of Marlo, mm-hmm. who is talking to an audience mm-hmm. in the boat, mm-hmm. the, Nel- the Nelly. Mm-hmm. Talk about mediation. Oh, Talk about it's, layers. It's, it's meta, as the kids would say yeah. these days. <laughs> and then Marlo tells us about Kurtz in the meantime. Yeah. So we're getting Kurtz through these many, many layers. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then ultimately we find out that this is the way he wants to pre- present the truth of Kurtz, yeah. if you will, to the intended, to his yeah. fiance. And um, before, before I know you're going to wrap things up here and I, I would suggest that maybe one of the best things to end with for me on my, at least on, on my part would be to, to, encourage people to go ahead and not just read Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, as you have so just brilliantly laid out this this wonderful text for us, but also to encourage people to read Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart, because that text does what Conrad doesn't do and couldn't perhaps do, and that is it fleshes out a people foibles flaws and nobility right all of it is there um but the reality is it's a fuller picture of the people that are just mainly used as a as a proper backdrop the only words that Ma, that um, conrad gives to an african in heart of darkness is mr kurtz he dead yeah mr kurtz Right. He dead, right? That's it. That's four, it. you know, four words, and and it's it's kind of that pigeon English. Mister Kurtz, he dead, right? Well, Chinua Chebe gives the African people of uh, in his imagination mm-hmm. a voice and a story and a and and a lot larger uh, canvas that that allows much more to be said than Mister Kurtz, he dead. And, and I won't give away, I don't want, I don't I like yeah, yeah. to do spoilers, but it, the, the book is so brilliant because there's a punchline mm. and it's worth, it, it pays off and it, it's worth the read. So, um, well, and as we go into next year, um, on the, on the next calendar year, you know, mm. on the podcast in, in 2023 here, um, Chinua Chibay's Things Fall Apart is on the list. Of oh, is it? Or, That's or, great. Or is on the list for books for us to read. So. Um, Beautiful. I think in, I believe it's in February, we're going <laughs> to pair it with W.B. Dewa's Souls of Black Folk, Booker T. Washington's Up from Slavery, and the narrative of Frederick Douglass. Um, so there's going to be a lot of things happening in that month, and yeah. uh, perhaps we will have you back to talk a little bit about that as well. Cool. So, I'd love to. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm not ignorant to it, but I wanted to get one thing at a time, right? And all things yes. equally, right? Yeah. So we got to get, we got to deal with heart of darkness. We have to deal with the things that make us uncomfortable in a Western context, figure out what we can draw from them. And then in concentric circles, we can build out to multiple other things because Chinua Achebe is part of a very complicated narrative um, of Africans. And he's at the beginning of it, by the way, the beginning of a very complicated narrative of um, African peoples, yeah. beginning to define themselves. Yeah. Not necessarily in opposition to European colonialism, although there is a strain of that and there probably will be for another couple of generations, but defining themselves um, well in the context of their own long history and their own yes. feet. Yeah. Um, 
and that is that is that is that is a project um, worth looking at um, and worth thinking about, um, particularly as we are a multicultural country with multicultural problems, and you know we're built on a creed, whereas other countries are built on other things. Um, they're built on tribes. They're built on affiliations. They're built on relationships. They're built on race. Um, but we are not. We're built on a creed. And I think that the the way that we view, the cultural lens that we view that through um, can be a very interesting filter for leaders to understand, mm -hmm. well, how to stay on the path. So speaking of which, what would you, just a final thought, what would you recommend as far as how leaders can read Heart of Darkness and stay on the path? of leadership stay on the path to closing that gap between what they say and how they actually act what how can leaders stay on the path moment i love the question and the answer is going to be a little bit more of the same <laughs> it's it's complicated and um i'm not going to give a ner a kernel kind of answer but what i would suggest is that within the gap within the answer of the, the the dilemma mm -hmm. of you know the what we do versus what we say i think that within the what we say you also need to build in the reality of the fact that we do have feet of clay mm -hmm. and so it's not enough it's not just about saying um here's my ideal and here's my practice right here's my theory and here's my practice and and somehow they've got to, 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 to butt up against each other to where there's no gap. With it, in the gap, mm -hmm. if the answer includes imperfection mm -hmm. or striving, let's just say mm -hmm. a, a striving for a reconciliation between the, 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 the places of failure and the, and the aspiration of fulfillment, right? In other words, for let me like let me come back to like say a, a church mm -hmm. example. Um, sure. Say there's a pastor. If the pastor's preaching that pastors are perfect, mm -hmm. and sets up a, a model that says pastors must attain this sort of like a level of of um, expectation of achievement. Mm -hmm. Well, they're creating within their own system a very dangerous model, right? Mm -hmm. there, as opposed to if, if a pastor were to say, I'm a leader and part of my leadership will be to show you what failure also looks like mm -hmm. it, it, as in the striving for um, excellence, mm -hmm. right? Even, even just looking over your left shoulder, I think it is, there's a, there's a word says failure i know that there's a book in front of <laughs> all, it says failure all it says there is failure you know it doesn't say <laughs> failure is a blah 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 right it covers the rest of that the aphorism up mm -hmm. but the, the, what i'm saying is is if failure is is in a sense built into the system mm -hmm. it, with with a view to it being a a genuine acknowledgement of the striving, the the uh, aspiration, I think that's that's going to leave us with a with a more like palatable outcome. Yeah. And um, I, I I know that people who don't try ever, mm -hmm. <laughs> well, well, they may they won't succeed because there's no trying, right? But they also right. won't. They've got to you've got to give yourself some room within the gap to yeah. fail in them. And that's part of the achievement. That's part of the achievement. Right. So um, I, I, I love, I love the question because um, with, I, I'm not so sure that Conrad gives us a, a better answer than to say leadership is complicated. Right. And um, 
And it's not like a kernel within a shell, but it's more like a misty halo that envelops the spectral, <laughs> blah, 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 <laughs> you know. The purple haze. The purple. <laughs> the purple haze. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Momenkazi, for coming on. Oh, my pleasure. Thank, thank you, you for, for inviting me. For the Great Books of the Great Books podcast. And uh, we're going to let you go here. Uh, I've got a little, i got some thoughts myself on the back end here, but we're going to let you go here. Thank you for joining us today. I do appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you again. Take care. And Dr. Momen Kazi is moving on his way, uh, moving on to his own radio show and teaching his own students in his own classes. I'd like to wrap up here, as I usually do, by talking a little bit about what we can learn um, from Heart of Darkness, how we can stay on the path as leaders. Fundamentally, leadership is hard, as Dr. Momen Kazi mentioned already, and leadership is complicated. There are dichotomies in leadership. There is no black and white. There is no necessarily always us and them. There's just the task and the path that you set yourself on as a leader and then following through on that task, uh, walking down that path and making sure that the path stays bright and that your feet stay planted. If you're in a small business, if you are running a major corporation, if you are leading other people, if you're leading your family or your community, or if you just like reading books that seem like they're not really about leadership but they're about something else, then this goes out to you. I want you to think about how do you keep your feet on the path. Marlowe's feet left the path and they traversed into the heart of darkness. It's real easy to step off the path. It's really easy to get off the boat and it's very hard to get back on the path. It's very hard to get back in the boat as Kurtz found out at the end. And sometimes you wander so far away from it that you cannot get back. And then you may get what indeed you deserve. Decisions have consequences and for every action, as is stated in thermodynamics, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Your people are going to have thoughts and the enemy gets a vote. Circumstances are going to push you and they're going to shape you. And of course, the organization and culture that you're in, whether it's family, community, or the neighborhood is going to create boundaries around you. There is going to be an established hierarchy and you are going to be judged by an ideal. And so what? Lead anyway. Lead when it's hard. Lead when it's complicated. Lead when you don't know where your foot's going next. Just trust and take a step forward this requires courage it requires clarity and it requires you to be candid first with yourself and then with your team if you don't know what you're doing and you have no idea what's next say that if you don't know the difference between the map and the territory but you want to co discover that say that as well invite people along on the journey enroll them in the vision and then you will move not into a path, well, you will maybe move on to a path that might be dark from one step to the next, but your journey will not be into the heart of darkness. Your journey will be through the heart of darkness and out to the other side into the light. And it won't be a murky haze, it won't be a purple haze, and it won't be a setting sun. Instead, it will be a rising tide, a rising light, a bright, shiny object that you can continuously move forward to for the benefit of yourself, the benefit of your community, the benefit of your team, your culture, and your organization. And well, as I usually say at the end of these podcasts, that's it for me. Well, if you liked that video, you should check out more by subscribing to the Leadership Lessons from the Great Books podcast playlist here on the HSCT Publishing YouTube channel. 
You can also get a copy of my third book, 12 Rules for Leaders, The Foundation for Attentional Leadership, co-written with Bradley Madigan. Check that out on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and everywhere where you get eBooks today. And thanks.